Living at sea sounds uber glamorous, doesn't it? Living on a cruise ship, hard to even imagine. In this episode, we are taking a closer look at what it's like to maintain a lifestyle as Chris Wilson pulls back the curtain and shows us exactly what it's like to own, live, and work on a cruise ship. This is the third episode in this three-part series of season four of Living at Sea. We'll dive right in and learn exactly what it's like on learning some of the nuances and things that we might not know about if we are thinking about obtaining a lifestyle just like this. And if you missed any of the previous episodes, we'll give you some insight into how Chris got started with the Aurora ship and kick the video off with a creator question. Take it away, John. Hi, my name is John Chow with Cruisetics. And I want to ask you, what first inspired you to start this project? I kept visiting the ship and over time I, uh, I kind of just pulled the trigger on it. I, I decided uh, I needed to do something. And and here we are today. So living on a cruise ship, and particularly <laughs> any ship in general, is an alternative lifestyle that a lot of people admire. So let's learn a little bit more from Chris as what that life really looks like. So tell me, Chris, we're living on this Aurora cruise ship here, and we are in a marina. So I know there's a lot of different barriers to entry and things that we may not know. So do you pay a docking fee in this marina how does it all work give us some insight into this well okay so if if you're just a guy out there and you're interested in doing something similar to this and finding an old ship and, and renovating it which there's quite a few of us out there i'm sure <laughs> um you know you, you have to be really savvy on 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 how you do things so my goal on finding a location is to find a location that you know, or something like this, you, you, you can do an eventual profit sharing or, or something along those lines. Because if you had to pay a, you know, a monthly fee, you'd be sunk right away. That, that's that's mm. just how it works. So, the, you know, the idea is to get this ship into a, into a condition where it's making, you know, far more money than, uh, you know, than, than it could if you were not renting out areas or doing areas. And then um, you, you work out your profit sharing and it's a win-win for both of you. Uh, you know, win-win for the marina because they're making a bunch of money off of your events and, and uh, it's a win-win for me because we're, you know, we, we don't have uh, that, that lingering uh, monthly docking fee. Mm -hmm. So what other areas, are is there particular insurance that you have to have with owning a ship or things that are different from, you know, homeowner's insurance versus, you know, sh insurance for? Well, there's different types of insurances that you can get, but one that's uh, very difficult to get if, uh, you know, if you're a ship that hasn't been hauled out of the water for a while is bottom insurance. Mm. And that's... Uh, you know, because it has to be pulled out of the water and inspected and, and, and all that stuff. And it's kind of cost prohibitive for a boat this size. So there's certain types of insurances you could take out that will cover the ship and cover the ship sinking. But, um, but you know, don't, don't plan on, you know, insuring, uh, you know, thinking you're going to get away with a, a, a cheap insurance to cover the whole thing because it just won't happen. I see. The cost of owning a ship of really any size is what really might intrigue someone to get into this is that it may be a very inexpensive way to tap into an alternative lifestyle. Is that something that a little bit you have seen? I know with the restoration project, it's kind of like a whole separate area of, but if you're just a, looking at your cost of living, would you deem that to be true? That it's... Well, not, not on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, if you, if you can, you know, uh, buy a houseboat or, or like a, a little converted tugboat or something like that, then, you know, you, you don't really have that, that much maintenance and you can just live on it and stay at the marina and, but, um, you know, something like this, we spend, Oh gosh, uh, you know, upwards of twenty thousand per month, if not more. Some months it's it's a lot more, but that's uh, redoing areas and maintaining areas, and uh, you have to maintain the areas after you redo the areas, <laughs> and it, it it all costs money. And um, you know, you of course on materials you try to cut corners, but that's one thing we've been 
strictly avoiding is we don't want garbage materials. You know, mm -hmm. we want the right stuff for the job. We just have to, you know, make more money as we go. And, and you know, that, that's one thing that we've always uh, been pretty good at doing. Yeah, so what would you estimate as like a monthly mortgage fee of living on a ship? How much money would you suggest to someone at home would they be looking to spend? Well, if you, if you stay in the under 100 foot range, then you're, you're probably looking at still the cost of, uh, of a couple of you know, a couple of four bedroom houses, you know, <laughs> and that's that's uh, mortgage and payments. But I mean, the smaller you get, obviously the cheaper things are going to be. That's why a lot of people buy houseboats and mm -hmm. then they can spend four or five hundred dollars living in a in a slip fee. But once you have to pull out the commercial dock in order to, to you know, stay somewhere, that's when you're uh, that's when the bill starts going up. That's perhaps a con to this lifestyle, but what are some of the other pros and other cons that you can think of of living at sea, essentially? <laughs> oh, there's so many pros to it. <laughs> oh, gosh. I can see your eyes light up. <laughs> the pros of, uh, of, of doing this um, are that it's something, something different every day. You know, every day you can spend all day in a, in a different part of the ship working on stuff or hanging out or, or you know doing whatever you want. There's there's some areas of this ship that I, I haven't seen in two years. Yeah. What? You know? Oh yeah. Really? I mean I mean, you know, they're on a need to need to see basis, like some of the you know, some of the room areas up forward, I don't need to see them, so I haven't seen them right. in a couple of years. I guess that makes sense when you really think about it, but that is surprising. <laughs> you know, you have your routine essentially and you're not you know yeah yeah you get a routine and you get the areas that you primarily uh, spend your time in so no it's it, it, it's it's truly an adventure I mean if you if you have the skills and the knowledge to do something like this I highly recommend it because because it's uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world this has been just the best experience do you have any advice for someone who does want to? What would you be the main thing you would want to tell someone before they decided to either work on a huge restoration project of a ship or to embark on ship life? Well, when I jumped in, I jumped in knowing nothing. I didn't know <laughs> ship people. I didn't know ships. I didn't even know boats. I didn't even know that the California Delta existed. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how in the dark I was. But um, I jumped in anyway and it just felt right. And you know, if you're gonna do it, it's either gonna feel right for you or, or it's not. Mm -hmm. um, but some people are, are naturals and luckily it, I kind of turned out to be kind of a natural. You, you know, if you're, if you're a quick learner and you can figure things out and you, you, uh, you can maintain one of these things yourself, mm -hmm. then, then it's, it's an absolute yes, I mean, you know, it's something that you should do, but the, so my advice is get to know as many people with, uh, with uh, large boats as possible because you wind up trading a lot of materials and paints and, and tools and, and knowledge, and, and knowledge <laughs> you know, and, you know, get to know that crowd as quick, quickly as you can and, and, mm -hmm. and keep those people because they'll either wind up being your best friends or some of them your worst enemies. <laughs> Oh no. So I haven't met any of the enemies yet, but I've, That's good. I've heard this from other people though. So. Well, it's wise advice to, you know, understand what you're getting into. And Absolutely. I think it really is just so incredible. The fact that you came from such a clean slate, almost, I'm sure people would have called you naive to, you know, oh, he doesn't know what he's getting his, you know, getting into essentially. And yes. the biggest hurdle that you, that, that you wind up having to overcome is you have 99% uh, of the people love what you're doing and they respect it and mm. they, they look at you and they say, oh my gosh, this is, this is wonderful. You're saving a piece of history. Um, and then you have that 1% that just, you know, rotten telling you, you, you can't do it. And that's a, that's a wrong thing to tell me is you can't do it because I'm going to do it. <laughs> uh, but the, the, you know, the politics behind it, you know, Generally, uh, not all not, not not all the agencies are going to be a hundred percent behind you. Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have uh, you, you're going to have a lot of them that respect what you're doing, and, and in our case, we have the Coast Guard. They seem to respect what we're doing pretty well, and all the agencies that actually know vessels, 
they seem to respect what we're doing, but then there's the agencies that don't have a lot of knowledge about vessels and they and they just they, they can't wrap their head around it. There we're just in the you know, we're just not in the right place. And nowhere you go in this whole world, you're gonna be in the right place for all agencies. But it's not a matter whether they like it, it's whether you can actually work your way into getting them to respect what you're doing. And I think that we've really been uh, working on that respect over the last uh, last couple of years. So Chris, thank you so much for sharing such incredible knowledge with us here. It really is fascinating to walk the corridors and get the whole view of everything and the story that the ship has and your story as well and how you're carrying it <laughs> through. So where can we find you on social media and Aurora and follow along and continue to learn more as, as the project continues? Well, if you, uh, if you go to Aurora Restoration Project on, um, on Facebook, we have a rather large group of uh, you know, fans also. Some of you might actually be members already. <laughs> Recently, I've made an Instagram account. Don't have a lot on there yet, but we expect to have quite a bit more as things progress. That and even if someone wanted, if they were local and wanted to uh, adopt a room. So if you're interested, you know, please contact me via email. You know, we haven't started that yet, but as soon as we start that program, then uh, we'll give all of the information. If you guys have any questions as well, feel free to leave them in the comments down below and we'll follow up and answer the rest of them with this beautiful ship here. So thank you again. And friends at home, if you enjoyed the video, please do remember to give it a big thumbs up. Until next time, ciao for now.